Hi, I'm David A. Wheeler. Let's keep looking at Metamath Lamp. So, right now I want to take a tour of the Explorer tab. Uh, the tab bar up here lets you switch between tabs, including settings, basic configuration settings, editor, editing, a proof, and the Explorer. Now, the Explorer tab lets us view the assertions, you know, particularly the axioms and theorems, in the, whatever the current loaded context is. Now, of, of course, if you want to see a final rendering of a widely used Metamath database, such as ZMM, you can just simply go to the Metamath homepage. Uh, on that website, you'll see some nicely rendered versions of databases like the Metamath Proof Explorer, aka set.mm, or the Intuitionistic Logic Explorer, that's um, iset.mm. Uh, there's also the New Foundations Explorer and the Higher Order Logic Explorer, uh, among others. Now, now those websites, web pages have some advantages. You know, each assertion, for example, uh, has its own URL, it loads very, very quickly, and displays well even when JavaScript is disabled on the web browser. Um, and they've got pretty formats and lots of additional information like syntax hints and such, and uh, divisions into chapters and subchapters with discussions, okay? Um, as well as some additional documentation. However, the built-in Metamath Lamp Explorer also has its own advantages. Okay. Uh, in particular, the Metamath Lamp Explorer will always show you the current context, which might not be the same as whatever the current uh, version of the official public databases are. Um, and this means, for example, you can explore other databases or historical databases or portions or combinations of databases. Um, now, the Minimath Lamp Explorer also includes some special abilities, like the fragment selector, so you can copy something in, say, into a proof you're editing, uh, or, and also its visualization mechanism. And, of course, you can do all this while disconnected with the Internet. So, uh, so we're going to try out this Explorer here. But before we dive in, I want to talk a wax a little uh largely here about almost a philosophical view. There's some magic here, okay? Truth is precious, truth is hard to find, and hard to confirm. Okay? Uh, and one of the beautiful things about mathematics is that it is possible to achieve an eternal kind of truth. You know, once something is correctly proven, it's always going to be true for the assumptions given. Um, sadly, this kind of beauty is often hidden. So Metamath is in some ways a kind of magic. Uh, Metamath lets you view the full chain of logic all the way from high-level proof ideas all the way back to axioms with no exceptions. And this is true for any Metamath-based uh, approach. Um, and there's a real magic in showing things like geometry and algebra and calculus and topology and many other mathematical ideas can all be built from a very few, very small set of axioms. Um, but this isn't the kind of magic that creates a mystery. It's the kind of magic that reveals mysteries. And the Metamath Lamp Explorer, as well as the explorers on the Metamath homepage, all let you discover these kinds of truths. Okay, including their webs of surprising uh, interconnections. So in this section, we're going to learn how to use the Explorer that's built into Metamath Lamp. Before we can do that, we have to load a context to look at. Okay. Uh, now, if you've been continuing from uh, the previous section, you already have a, con a context loaded. Uh, but if you're just starting from here, you don't, you might not. So let's pick on a web source. I'm going to load set mm. Um, for our purposes, it doesn't matter if we load the whole thing or not. So I'm probably just going to do read all and apply changes. And we'll just read in the whole database. Okay. Now, once this loads in, we're going to try out the Explorer tab. Okay, so right over here, click on Explorer. The Explorer view lets you see the various assertions, particularly the axioms and theorems, in the current context. So on the very, very top, 
It lets you select what to view. By default, it's both axioms and theorems, but you can specify labels or patterns to search for, to go find. Um, you can also get rid of those filters. Below these selection options is a list of assertions, theorems and axioms. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Each assertion shows its numeric position, one, two, three, okay? Uh, what kind of assertion? Is it a theorem or an axiom? Okay. And the label, its name, IDI, WN, these are AX-MP, these are all labels or names of these um, assertions. Okay. So <clears throat> for each one, you can see it lists after its name and uh, you know what kind of name. It lists the hypotheses, if there are any, preceded with a big black circle, and finally its conclusion. The order of assertions is actually important in a database. In particular, a theorem can only refer to previous assertions. You know, if if your position number ten, if your assertion number ten, you can only refer to one through nine. This eliminates the possibility of circular reasoning. Uh, also, when you tell MetaMath Lamp to limit a scope, okay, say to stop reading before something, then every theorem, every axiom after that is not going to be considered as long as that's the current context. We're going to scroll down here a little bit to um, AXMP. Okay, this is axiom AXMP. It's also known as modus ponens. Okay. Um, this is what it looks like in the display. We have two hypotheses for axiom AXMP. One says pH, and, and that just means that you know, one hypothesis is that pH is true. And the other one says that pH implies PS. And if pH is true and pH implies is true, if we assume those two things, then we are allowed to assert that PS is true. Okay, psi, basically. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, note that pH or phi and PS, psi, uh, they're not necessarily just variables. These are stand ins for any expression that can be true or false. Okay, it's, called, it's any stand in for something called a well formed formula, okay, or a woof, okay, um, a, some statement that's true or false. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, modus ponens can apply to many, many different circumstances. Okay. Um, now, the Explorer has some interesting capabilities. One is that you can use the fragment selector. Okay. Um, another is that you can find out more about um, a particular axiom or theorem. So let's start with this. Let's click on this symbol right here, the little um, greater than symbol to the right of the name. Okay. Don't click on the name yet. We'll get there. We're just going to click on this for now. And what it does is it will immediately display the, the description of it, okay? And you can click on this again to hide it, okay? You can also use, as I said, the fragment selector. So if I click on this open paren, it immediately selects that whole statement and shows me various options from the fragment selector. I'm going to click on uh, unselect here. Okay. Now, let me talk about a couple proof state, uh, symbols that are used within set.mm. Uh, I've already hinted at them a little bit. This dash and greater than and greater than symbol is a representation of an arrow, in particular a representation of implies. So ph arrow ps means ph implies ps. The left hand side is called the antecedent. The right hand side is called the consequent. ph and ps, and in fact ch. Okay. They all stand for Greek letters, specifically psi, uh, sorry, phi, psi, and chi. Uh, and these are variables that will represent arbitrary expressions that are true or false. Uh, later on down, we'll see a dash and a dot, okay, like in AX-3. That means logical not. So if you have a dash and a dot and the following expression is true, the uh, result of the whole thing is false. Uh, and there's a longer list of uh, common symbols, if you like. Now, let's scroll down a little bit further, and we're going to view the proof of MP2, okay? Theorem MP2. If you click on this name, 
not the greater than sign error, but the actual name of this theorem, something interesting is going to happen. Okay, if you click on the on the label, you'll be able to learn more about that theorem. That's pretty amazing stuff. Okay, uh, <clears throat> um, basically, clicking on the name of an axiom or theorem will switch the view to a dynamic tab of that name that shows you details about it. You notice it created a dynamically created a new tab. Okay, um, these dynamic tabs are sometimes called individual assertion tabs. Okay. Um, and if you want to get rid of it, you can push that X to get rid of it. Um, within an, an individual assertion tab, you can see things like, well, what's the name? What kind it is? In this case, it's a theorem, it's description, the hypotheses it has, its conclusion, and then down here, it's proof, okay? Um, with the steps of the proof. And the, the, the steps are just numbered starting at one. Um, if you click on a hypothesis step label like this three, it would move you so that that's right at the top of the screen. Okay, this is helpful when you have long proofs. Okay. The interesting thing is, well, what happens if I click on this referent? Well, it's going to create another tab and tell you about that. And so you can keep going and going to learn more. Okay. I'm going to go back to MP2 now. Okay. At the beginning of each statement is a little icon that's an expander icon. So PSCH is an application of AXM2, MP, sorry. If I click on that, oh look, I have a visualization. Okay, how in the world did I get to this PH implies PH implies CH? Well, Again, we have a visualization. This is what AXMP does, and this is how we're using AXMP in this particular circumstance. Okay, so <clears throat> it turns out that step four is justified by the use of AXMP, which is modus ponens, and at the center of our visualization is the usual representation of a rule. We have modus ponens, which has two preconditions. It needs a pH, and it needs a pH implies PS. If it has those two things, it can conclude a PS. Now, what are we applying for, um, what are we substituting in this case? Well, we're gonna substitute pH for pH. And for the pH over here, we'll again have to assign pH, but for our PS, we're going to assign PS implies CH. And that means our result is going to be PS implies CH. Um, this visualization basically shows how the symbols move, uh, flow in and out of the rule. All right, let me hide that now. Okay, now I wanna talk a little bit about revealing types in these individual assertion tabs. Metamath proofs include proofs of the types of every expression to ensure that all the expressions have valid types. Um, making sure that the types are valid is, is critical to making the proofs overall valid. Okay. And internally, Metamath systems verify types the way they do everything else. There have to be axioms that describe valid types. Okay. And, there and then it has to prove that the expressions being used match whatever their required types are. Now, normally, you won't ever have to see this or deal with types. Okay. Metamath la Lamp, for example, automatically handles all the type checking for you. It automatically figures out the types. So by default, the proofs that um, the types are correct aren't, being sh aren't shown. However, um, we think it's really important that you understand types and what the tools are doing for you underneath. And Metamath Lamp can reveal this more detailed view about types if you wish to see this information. So if you want, if you click on Show Types here, you'll see suddenly we have a lot more steps here. This reveals how Metamath proves that every expression is syntactically legal. Uh, step five here, for example, um, uses a reference to something called WPS, which is an assertion that, in fact, something called PS is a well-formed formula, a woof. Okay. Uh, step seven then uses that information to prove that this expression, open paren, PS implies CH, close paren, is also a woof. And you can even expand that. Okay where I know that PS is a woof, I know that CH is a woof, 
I have a rule that lets me take those individual woofs into a, with an implication into a woof. Therefore, that must also be a woof. This reveals how MetaMath ensures that every expression has the correct type in an existing proof. Now, you can also make the editor reveal whether or not an expression is of a given type. Um, and again, we're going to do this so that we get a better understanding of what's going underneath the surface. I've changed my mind. I think I want to uh, bring in that proof of 2 plus 2 equals 4. So let's just bring that in. I've uh, pasted it into the clipboard the proof that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So let's go ahead and use that. <clears throat> Okay, now um, I'm going to click on the checkbox next, and may as well unify. I'm going to click on this checkbox next to seven, which uses OVEQ2, uh, OVEQ1i, sorry. Okay, now I'm going to duplicate that. It's complaining because I have a duplicate, that's fine. Okay. But I, instead of determining whether or not this statement is true, I'm going to long click on it and edit it and ask it to prove that it is a well-formed formula. Okay, you know, so far we've asked if some things are true, we can also ask the editor, hey, can you prove that this is a well-formed formula? Okay, well, let's see here. Um, let's click on unify. And the answer is yes, it can prove that. Okay, it's it can also prove that statement is true. That's a well-formed formula. Not that this statement is a correct statement about the world, just that it is syntactically a woof. Um, <clears throat> now, we all notice the justification here is different, right? Before we asked if this was true, it gave a particular reason. Here, it's giving a very different reason. WCEQ. Why is that? Well, if I visualize this, what it's saying is that the justification for this is something um, that takes an A equals B form, and as long as the left-hand side is a woof and the right-hand side's a woof, then the whole thing is a woof. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that WC equal is the uh, label that lets me assert that you know, as long as the left-hand and right-hand sides are a well-formed formulas, then the whole thing is a well-formed formula. Okay. Um, now we could use this fragment selector and repeatedly copy and create new ones of these if you wanted to uh, create a long visualization like this. But if you're just trying to look at something in, down in the details, uh, there's another way to do this quickly. Um, now if you if you actually want to do this, the simple approach here is use the bottom-up prover. Okay. I'm going to click on this. In the bottom up prover, and I'm going to turn on something called logging levels. Okay, um, logging levels will basically track some uh, tree the proof tree up to a certain point to let me see how things are going. Um, helpful when you're trying to figure out uh, types, for example. Okay, so I have pushed proof, and now I can show the proof tree. This is the what did it find? Well, it found that indeed that that is a, a woof, and I've got a little green check mark. Why is that? Well, let's click on expand. Well, it's because it met the requirement for WCEQ using state steps six and one. Why is that? Well, step six is because this is a class, and step one is because this other expression is a class. Okay, why does it think that? Well, you can expand it further, and in fact, you'll find out there's something called CO that takes these kinds of statements and can improve them if they're a class. And I can expand this here, and I can just keep expanding and expanding. Um, so basically, another way to read this would be that the type code class applies to 2 plus 1 plus 1, okay, because, and that's justified by reference to something called CO, referring again to steps 4, 3, and 2, and it repeats. Okay, a metamath proof proves that expressions are of a certain type the same way it proves that claims are true. Metamath requires that there be an existing rule of reference. Okay, now again, you don't normally need to see this stuff. Okay, um, 
I'm showing this to give you an idea that, because I think it's helpful to understand what the tool is doing under the hood that you don't have to deal with because yes, it types do matter and it is checking them for you. And in fact, those are parts of the proof, even though by default, we don't show them they're in there. Okay. So uh, I'm going to cancel out now. Now you can use the Explorer to gain all sorts of interesting insights into a database. Okay. In this section, we're going to walk through just the first few assertions of set.mm to get a little understanding of this database. And by assertions, I mean axioms and theorems. Okay, we we'll click back to the Explorer. So let's start looking. The first one we have is a theorem called IDI. Now, we are starting in the basement. Remember, by default, Metamath knows no axioms. Okay, so we have, we're going to be starting it with pretty basic concepts. IDI is really, really basic. Okay, um, <clears throat> it looks like this. In IDA, all the statements begin with a that a bar and a dash, which means this is true. And basically theorem says, theorem IDI says that if pH is true, if I assume that pH is true, then I can assert that pH is true. Okay. <clears throat> if you click on this, you can see the description. Okay. Now every axiom or and every theorem in set MM has a description. In this case, you can see that this was contributed by Alan Sayer. Um, the names of people who formalize and propose things are recorded in the descriptions. I really hope someday I'm going to see your name in these descriptions. Now, theorem IDI, and in fact, this one and the next one a, um, called uh, A1II are really, really strange. Um, these are theorems that can be proven in Metamath without a an axiom in the usual sense of it. And the reason is this is a technical one. Uh, what Metamath verifiers do is they repeatedly, uh, is they can take the hypotheses and then repeatedly take uh, any proven theorem or axiom so far and apply them per direction in the proof to produce the final result. In this odd case though, um, the hypothesis is what we're proving. So all it really needs is zero essential steps. And there's one that's basically a syntax proof step that says, yeah, you can copy this to that. And oh, that's the answer. Okay. This doesn't hurt MetaMath's generality. It's really hard to imagine a useful mathematical system where you're not allowed to conclude something when you assume it. Okay. That said, Theorem IDI isn't really very helpful. It doesn't let us conclude anything new. It just lets us acknowledge what we already know. It's normally not useful. It's only useful in very, very specialized technical situations, but there are cases where those occur. Um, now you'll notice at the end of this description is this interesting phrase, new usage is discouraged, okay? This statement is true, okay? But, and you can use it if you want to, but, Usually it's not useful. So we discourage it's used under normal cases. It's not going to help you, okay? Similarly for I, A, A, I, oh, sorry, A1II, if pH is true, if, if you assume that pH is true and you assume that PS is true, then you can conclude that pH is true. If you assume two things, you can pick one of them, okay? Again, this is only useful in very special technical situations, but it's hard to argue with the conclusion. If you assume something, you can conclude it too. Axiom number three, uh, assertion number three is an axiom, but it's not an assertion of truth. It's an assertion that something is a well-formed formula. In this case, we're asserting that pH is a well-formed formula, then when you put not in front of it, it's still a well-formed formula. And this is how we assert syntax, okay? Uh, given something, I can then assert that something else uh, is also valid syntax. Similarly for axiom four, if pH and PS are individually well-formed formulas, then if you add parentheses around it and an implies zero between them, the whole result is a well-formed formula. We've already seen assertion five, that's the axiom modus ponens. 
Assertion six is axiom AX1. This one and the next two, these, these three axioms, define the axioms of what's called propositional logic. Basically, it's the fundamental rules for determining if something is true or false, given, given that something else is true or false. Okay? Um, these are the same as many, many other sources. Okay? Axiom AX1, we expanded it with the description. You'd see that, in fact, this is a, um, a formalization that was contributed by someone named NM. Okay. Um, yeah, contributed by NM. NM is Norman McGill, or Norm McGill. He's the original creator of the MetaMath system. Once again, we give credit to those who take the time to formalize mathematics, and we would love to see your name here, too. Okay. This just says that if uh, if pH implies pa, uh, I'm sorry, if ps implies pH, if psi implies phi, well then phi would imply that psi implies phi. Okay. Uh, axiom ax two is also called Frigg, and basically it really just distributes the um, uh, impl implication. Okay. And finally, ax three, sometimes called transposition. Okay, and these are, as I said, these are widely accepted axioms. And we've already talked about MP2, which is our first useful theorem. And this is basically, it's proving a claim that involves a, uh, applying modus ponens twice. Okay, now there's a lot more theorems, okay? Uh, lots more axioms too. Actually, not that many, but there are some more. Um, we're going to briefly mention another one, sill or syllogism. Let me drag down to that. Okay, right down here, sill. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this theorem, sill, syllogism, is uh, what it proves is that pH implies PS, phi implies psi, and PS implies CH, psi implies chi. If you assume those two things, then you can conclude that phi implies chi. Um, basically, it's it's going to be proving that implication is transitive. Uh, this particular theorem is one of the most commonly used theorems in the entire uh, set.mm database. Now, these are really, really basic beginnings. What's really extraordinary is that you can start with such humble, small beginnings and build up step by step to eventually prove really complex mathematical ideas. If you wish to see other information beyond this, uh, you can go see, for example, the MetaMath homepage.